Uh, this is to show the difference between the chronic and episodic migraine. And of course, as, as the slide shows, the, it's, it's bad to have the, uh, the chronic migraine. It, it's associated with, uh, with uh, disability. Uh, it's associated with uh, low income and um, cutaneous allodynia, which is a marker of sensitization, increased sensitivity to light touch. And also, uh, we found that uh, psychiatric comorbidities, uh, uh, pain conditions, and cardiovascular conditions are comorbidated uh, and have higher prevalence in chronic migraine compared to episodic. This is derived from two studies from MPP data. <coughs> and uh, th these are cross-sectional uh, data. So uh, just to illustrate how, how significant the findings are, and even though the prevalence of chronic migraine is not that high compared to episodic, but overall, if you calculate, there are new studies showing that uh, the impact on individual and society is much higher for chronic migraine compared to episodic. Uh, and of course, the uh, interesting question about pathophysiology. Nobody knows for sure what, uh, what the pathophysiology of migraine is, but we have some idea because we have some studies, animal data and human data, demonstrating that we have some events in different areas of the brain, each responsible for, uh, for migraine headache. We don't know where the initial, uh, initial kind of event is, but we know that uh, there are several areas are involved. And one of the major areas which is important is the meningeal structures and peripheral structures. Now here we have uh, perivascular nociceptors, and when we have a dilatation of the vessels, there is a leak of, uh, of neuropeptides. Uh, CGRP, uh, you know, uh, vasoactive peptides, which can, um, neurokinin A, which can activate peripheral nociceptors, and uh, then we have peripheral sensitization. Interestingly, what happens, there is an antidromic stimulation here, too, so the activation of the neuron itself causes the dilatation of the vessels, too, uh, by, 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 this, by, the nerve, by the connection of the nerve endings with the vessels. And then we have the initial event, which is the first order neuron, which goes through the trigeminal nerve, through the trigeminal ganglion, and from there connects with the spinal and uh, trigeminal uh, spinal nucleus. From there, there's a connection of second order neuron to the thalamus, and from the thalamus to the cortex, to the parietal areas. Now, uh, some studies show that there is also uh, activation of uh, the receptors here in this area as well. And when the individuals co uh, complain about the allodynia or increased sensitivity, uh, it has been postulated that there is a uh, excit increased excitability of the neurons uh, at the second uh, order neuron level and the third order, neur order neuron level. And uh, the other important event is in migraine aura, we, we have sometimes what's called um, cortical spreading depression, which is depolarization of neurons, which starts in occipital cortex and moves slowly to the parietal cortex. Now, and some uh, researchers believe that by uh, inducing by inducing this neuronal activity here, there is a connection to the thalamus and also the brainstem <coughs> structures where the activation of nociceptive pathways occurs. And, uh, and there are some doctors who believe that the primary uh, event is actually in the brainstem. So we don't have any consensus about uh, what, where the migraine starts and um, what, which event is important, but we know that there is an activation of trigeminal nociceptive pathways, and also we know that uh, there are some centers which can contribute. Now, this happens during the episode of migraine. Now, what happens during the chronic migraine? So what we think that happens is that there is continuous nociceptive processing, and which calls central synthesization. And it might be that here in the, in the, in the ponds, there, there is a, or actually upper midbrain, there is, a, there is some centers which, called, which have this with descending modulation of the pain. Uh, they might have a problem there. It could, we, we could be, the result would be the decreased uh, descending inhibition. Um, so, but still, it's all speculation. Some of it is based on hypothesis, and uh, there's so much work going on now. Uh, other, now here we talk about the pain and nociception, but there are other features of migraine inflammation, like photophobia, phonophobia, nausea. There are some centers in the brainstem which regulate this, uh, this events and migraine. Whether there is a connection between these centers and nociceptive pathways, we don't know, but it's plausible to think that there is. And, uh, and a lot of work going on to, to see if, whether the photophobia actually uh, is a major uh, problematic factor in, in developing the pain. Uh, yes, that if, 
and unfortunately, if you get this situation on 15 or more days, then people uh, transform to chronic migraine. And this occurs uh, uh, on uh, approximately 2 to 3% of uh, migraine nurse annually. And uh, Dr. Bigal uh, from Albert Einstein College of Medicine pr proposed uh, this model for, uh, for migraine headache. So this is based on uh, epidemiological and, and clinical data. We know that migraineurs can uh, have uh, three pathways. One is they can remit, and it occurs actually in, in, uh, in anywhere from 3 to 9% to, to of, of individuals. And uh, it can persist in majority of cases, 70 or higher, uh, unchanged, stable, or it can transform in 2 or 3% of cases, uh, as I showed in the previous slide. Now, Dr. Bigal uh, uh, suggests like, three, three terms. He, he uses clinical transformation, functional transformation, and anam anatomical. Clinical, he, uh, when, he says about, when he talks about clinical, he talks about increased attack frequency over the time. Uh, which is easy to, to understand. Functional is the changes in nociceptive thresholds, it's allodynia, change in the pain pathways. And anatomic, we see sometimes in migraine nerves that uh, they can get the white matter lesions. Nobody knows their, uh, uh, what pathological mechanisms uh, they involve, but we know that we see them and actually they correlate with increased frequency. And, and a lot of research is going on now to see whether uh, they can, um, lead to any conditions like, like stroke or, uh, or, or they can actually aggra aggravate the pain and, and, and make the chronic migraineurs more prone to get the, uh, to, to have the continuous headache. <coughs> Another conceptual framework uh, Dr. Bigalt have suggested is to, uh, to look at migraine as, as a continuum from no migraine to chronic migraine. And in this continuum we have low frequency episodic migraine and high frequency episodic migraine. Now each individual, individual can transform from one type to another type. And this transformation, uh, we believe that can be uh, uh, regulated by, by certain uh, risk factors. And these factors can be uh, demographic, environmental, or genetic. And this slide is important because the knowing these risk factors can, can help you to uh, initiate proper therapies, you know, and also uh, help you to control these risk factors in order to avoid the transformation. So it has a huge uh, clinical implication. And um, I want to mention a little bit about the AMPP study. Uh, I've been part of this study. And uh, this is a large uh, epidemiological study which has been uh, designed by Richard Lipton at Einstein. And he, uh, with this study, he wants to use uh, enormous number of migraineurs and look at longitudinally what happens to them. So what happened is that we sent the questionnaires in 2004 to 120,000 U.S. households. And uh, we, uh, 162,562 responded. Mm -hmm. And of those, we isolated 28,600, which had severe headaches. And of those with severe headaches, uh, we, to the 24,000, uh, the questionnaires were mailed each year from 2004 to th 2010. Uh, the questionnaire is, is, is pretty extensive. It's almost 17 pages, and it has, uh, uh, which makes it difficult for, the, uh, for, for, for individuals to fill out, but it has some uh, data on demographics, social economic data, headache frequency, severity, uh, symptoms of the headache, the, uh, the IHS criteria, allodynous symptoms, which use the, uh, uh, the validated measures and, uh, you know, questions about psychiatric comorbid conditions. Now, in, uh, in the study which I was involved, we look at depression, and uh, we used uh, the PHQ-9 questionnaire. And what we did is that we used, uh, we used logistical regression analysis. We looked at the development of chronic migraine uh, from in episodic migraineurs in 2005. So if you present with episodic migraine in 2005, if you developed uh, chronic migraine, then we look at your um, uh, the risk factors and see how uh, how they've been affecting you, the transformation. So there are two events actually. It, uh, one is from 2005 to 2006, and the other one is uh, it has to be <laughs> from 2006 to 2007. We adjusted analysis for age, gender, income, insurance, <coughs> uh, headache rate, disability, uh, self-reported anxiety, uh, BMI, and allodynia. All known possible risk factors for chronic migraine. <coughs> 